All right, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this is a program of the Oberlin Heritage Center. My name is Liz Schultz and I'm the director. So um, I know many of you, I recognize your name and you know that we are a local historical society in Oberlin, Ohio. And our mission is to preserve and share Oberlin's unique heritage and make our community a better place to live, learn, work and visit. Um, I'm happy to say that we are reopened to the public, so stop on by for either a self-guided tour Tuesday through Saturday or a guided tour on Thursday and Saturday. And if you're not already signed up to our newsletter, consider doing that because we have updates about uh, upcoming events. Uh, we'll be getting into community events and hopefully some warmer weather soon. So just a few Zoom tips here. Um, so if you're joining us from a computer, usually there is an option in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that you can try a gallery view or speaker view and make that however you want. If you're joining us from a phone or a tablet, you can usually swipe a few different ways to see some different views. But again, we do ask that you remain uh, muted during the program until the Q&A part, unless you really have a, a burning question. Lori said she's open to, to people if she needs to clarify something during the program. Um, but otherwise, uh, Please keep yourself muted in case the, like the phone goes off or there's background noise there. Well, so Lori Osborne is the executive director for the Center for Women's History and Leadership in Evanston, Illinois, which includes the Francis Willard House Museum and Women's Christian Temperance Union Archives. She also directs the Evanston Women's History Project at the Evanston History Center. She holds a master's degree in English literature from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in public history from, from Loyola University in Chicago. Um, I first became aware of this, uh, the, tonight's program focusing on Frances Willard and Ida B. Wells when their uh, exhibit was received an honorable mention for uh, outstanding public history project from the National Council on Public History. Uh, so we were very excited to invite Lori to, to come and talk to us. Of course, from Oberlin, we're always interested in women's history, but also um, being critical of suffrage and women's history and knowing how sometimes these movements didn't um, advance everyone and, and that there was some uh, inequality within movements. So we always like to be taking a closer look at both the, the granular events, but also how they impacted national events. So we're very excited. Um, but like I said, I wanted to sneak in a few things. Uh, thank you, Lori, for giving me time to do this too. Uh, to just talk, introduce like why Oberlin, why, what is this connection here? So Frances Willard um, was, uh, she wasn't born here at Oberlin, but uh, she came here very soon after. So these are her parents, Josiah and Mary Thompson Hill Willard. And they married in New York. And Frances was born in 1839 in Churchville, New York. And on the next slide, you can see a younger photograph of Frances, uh, again, born in 1839. And then by 1841, so just two years later, the family had moved to Oberlin. So she came here when she was quite young. Uh, she had some siblings, unfortunately, some, as was common, died, in, uh, died when they were younger. But these were some of her uh, other siblings who survived a bit longer. Uh, so her parents came here as what today we might call non-traditional students, that they already had a family going and they were both going to the college. Um, uh, so her father was in the preparatory school and the college looking into ministry and uh, mother was uh, in the ladies department and involved in various kind of women's organizations at that time. So both very involved in, in what we might call civic and, and public things. Um, so as I said, Frances came here when she was about two and they were only here for about five years. So by the time she was about seven, they had left Oberlin. So when I came to the Heritage Center, I thought, oh yeah, she lived here. And in my mind, I imagined her as, you know, a young adult or an adult. And it wasn't until recently, it's like, oh, she was a, she was a child. So, you know, you, you wonder how much, uh, you know, she really affiliated with Oberlin. But it turns out she seemed to be, be very fond of Oberlin. And not only that, but her parents choosing to come to Oberlin. I think Oberlin is sometimes self-selecting that people who believe in some of those early ideals of Oberlin came here and those also um, went down to her and her generation as well. So um, 
from research, just in case uh, the Oberlin people might be interested, these are where I believe I tracked uh, her parents' house down to. So the one on, you can see my mouse here, North Main Street. So this is now Tappan Square. So that we believe was their first house, probably rented, um, because later accounts mentioned that her father built the home on North Pleasant Street here. Uh, so again, they were in town about five years. Uh, so this is the North Main Street home, but I'm 99% I'm sure that this is not her home. Based on the footprint of old maps and this house today, I think this is a, a rebuilt house. And interestingly, the North Pleasant Street home, she mentions, uh, she claimed that her father's home was a station on the Underground Railroad, which is certainly believable in Oberlin. Unfortunately, I wish there was more like of a story behind that, and maybe we'll find one one day. But this is also, I'm afraid, is where that North Pleasant Street location is today. So we know it is a parking lot behind the, the hotel. Um, so neither of her homes, I believe, are still standing in Oberlin. Um, but jumping back to her parents, uh, so like I said, the family was here about five years, and Mary, her sister, was actually born here in Oberlin. And then they moved to Wisconsin for his health, um, and both the father and her sister died fairly young, um, but her mother was more of a companion as she grew older in life. So uh, her connection to Oberlin, I mean, Frances, as I said, was here as a child, but she did... Uh, from newspaper accounts, I can tell she came back a few times. So um, this photograph is not in Oberlin, but it's it's a sense of her speaking because one of the, the articles I found was from 1885 when she came to speak in First Church for the Women's Christian Temperance Union when she was president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So I'm gonna read you a quote from that newspaper account. Ms. Willard spoke from the open platform with a clear and distinct voice so that there was no difficulty in every word being understood in any part of the house. And you often read that in newspapers because prior to amplification, speaking ability was very important and the newspaper was going to comment on it. So she did a good job. Uh, in her introductory remarks and in other parts of her address, she alluded to Oberlin in a very complimentary manner to her childhood days, which were spent here, and to the feelings of her mother, now in her 81st year, toward the place as she knew it 40 years ago. She presented very strong arguments in favor of temperance instruction in public schools and in behalf of total prohibition. In the latter half of her address, she advocated the prohibition or third party movement and freely expressed her views in favor of women's suffrage. And I like this comment, there was an appeal at the end to help defray expenses. So a little bit of fundraising in there too. So that was in 1885. And this is by, by this time, she is well established as a, a, a national figure um, through the Women's Christian Temperance Union and, and other responsibilities. Um, the next article we find in local news is in 1895. And tonight's program is gonna entirely focus on what happened in 1895, that there was a big event. And I'll just say that Oberlin's paper only printed one article about it. And it was kind of a, I would say, almost say a secondary reprinting, like Oberlin didn't seem to publish an opinion on the controversy that we're gonna be hearing about tonight. Uh, the next bit in the news comes in 1897, where um, they were called Loyal Temperance Legion they sent her some flowers from that Pleasant Street home garden and uh, she wrote a reply. I don't think I'm gonna read it all tonight, but she was very touched and it reminded her of her sister, Mary, who had been born here in Oberlin and she had other complimentary memories to share with people. So she always did kind of identify with Oberlin. Um, so that was 1897 and she passed away the next year. So this was toward the end of her life. Uh, so her obituary was published in the paper in 19, 1898, and then oh, um, Oberlin continued to have events in her name, and I'm, I'm not sure if it was really Francis Willard or more the Temperance Union or a combination of both, but they, they had these events until uh, like 1939 seemed to be the last one I could find a date for, so she was still well recognized in Oberlin. Um, so I just wanted to bring, give a little context to her relationship to Oberlin that might also give a little context to what Oberlin may have thought of this event that happened in 1895. 
And this program is half about Ida B. Wells as well. And I just wanted to say, I tried to see if Wells had any connection to Oberlin as well. It wouldn't surprise me if she did, but I could not find it in any newspaper or anything else digitized at this point. Um, so that also will give us, at least in Oberlin's, uh, just a one-sided view of this event from Willard's side more. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, setting the stage. But next I'm going to stop share and I will turn things over to Lori. So thank you much, so much for joining us tonight from Illinois in Central Time. And uh, we're so delighted to have you here. Well, thank you, um, Liz. It's really fascinating to hear that you and I have talked about the, the connection, but um, I just find that really interesting to see it visually. And I do think that her time in Oberlin really, really was um, an influential time in her life, even though she was young. Um, the fact that I think especially her mother was in school there um, and the other women that her mother came in contact with, women like Lucy Stone, who ends up being very important to Willard. Um, and those that larger sense of women's role in the world, I think it starts there. It definitely gets carried on to the rest of her life. So let me um, share my screen. Um, so thank you again for having me. I'm very um, glad to be here and to talk about this um, project. I'm going to read um, because words are very important in this story. And I want to be sure I, I have the right words. Um, but please do interrupt me as I go along. I'm happy to, to take a question, especially if there's something that isn't clear. Um, it's a complicated story. Um, and I'll tell you a little about our website where you can dig much more deeply into the details. Um, so let's get started. So more than 100 years ago, two very strong and powerful women leaders could not find common ground over an issue of great importance. One of the women, Frances Willard, could not see that her failure to support the anti-lynching movement and her use of demeaning and incendiary words to describe African-Americans was morally wrong and potentially harmful. The other, Ida B. Wells, would not let Willard remain in a lofty position of power and influence while acting and speaking in such a way. At the Willard House and WCTU archives, we believe that telling Willard's story and of the significant work that the WCTU did under her leadership and beyond to grow women as leaders is still critical to telling the full story of our nation's history. But we also believe that telling of her failures as a leader is important and that we can learn much from telling the whole true story. I'm gonna start this talk with a little about the Willard House and archives and then introduce Frances Willard and Ida B. Wells for those who may not know much about them. From there, I'll describe in brief the conflict between them and how it happened and what the essential issues were. And then I'll finish with some information about our project and some reflections on the process and the outcome of our work. So a little about us. The Frances Willard House Museum is located at Willard's family home in Evanston, Illinois. The house has been a museum since 1900 and was managed by the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, for most of those years. In addition, the Willard Memorial Library and WCTU archive is also at the site and holds Willard's personal papers and the WCTU's organizational records. Both the museum and archive are now run by a separate nonprofit organization whose goal is to tell the full story of women's activism and social reform efforts in this time period and how it has shaped our world today. As part of this work in the lead up to the 2020 anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment, the museum archives and staff and board made a commitment to tell the truth of the conflict that happened between Willard and Ida B. Wells. We wanted to place the story of the conflict between these two significant American women in the larger context uh, and complex story of racism in America and American women's movements, especially the women's suffrage movement. 
So a little about Willard and the WCTU. As president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union from 1879 to 1898, Willard is best known today for her work to prevent the negative impact of alcohol on society, especially on women and children, and her lifelong mission to advance women's rights. Her development of the home protection argument in support of women's suffrage provided a critical strategy for the movement. And once she persuaded the membership of the WCTU to join her, it added thousands of women to the suffrage cause. By the mid 1890s, the WCTU was the largest organization of women in the United States with a broad social reform agenda. And it had grown into a worldwide and diverse organization. Willard and her family had been abolitionists before the Civil War, some of which they got uh, in contact with in their time in Oberlin, as Liz was talking about. And she carried this legacy into her work into the WCTU. Willard encouraged Black membership in the WCTU and spoke regularly to Black audiences. Noted Black leaders complimented her for this progressive, for the time, leadership, including Frederick Douglass, who said she was, quote, devoted to the cause of the colored people, end quote. Under Willard's leadership, the WCTU established a national department of work among the colored people headed by African-American women. Black women were also involved in local WCTU groups throughout the country, sometimes integrated with white women, more often as separate chapters. And we can talk a little more about that if you're interested. How Willard, however, Willard also carried with her a middle-class white women's limited perspective on race. Willard made public comments that were demeaning to black people and other people of color, reflecting the underlying racism that permeated our nation's culture. She also believed and encouraged racist propaganda and did not speak out strongly against lynching as it became an increasing problem in the 1880s and 90s. Ida B. Wells, in the same time period, was a rising reformer, an educator and pioneering journalist who began her civil rights activism in response to racist incidents she experienced in Memphis, Tennessee. After three close friends were arrested and lynched by a white mob in 1892, Wells began to investigate the growing number of lynching incidents in the United States. She published the pamphlet, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases later that year, and the offices of her Memphis newspaper, Free Speech and Headlight, were destroyed by a mob. Wells moved north and settled in Chicago and began to raise awareness and change public sentiment about lynching and other civil rights issues. By 1895, Wells' anti-lynching campaign was well underway, but she was frustrated by the reluctance of influential white reformers like Willard to support her work. Willard had made racist statements in a newspaper interview given in 1890, and Wells had seen and remembered the interview. While on a speaking tour of England in 1894, Wells republished the interview, publicly calling into question Willard's leadership. In the interview, Willard had invoked what Wells described as, quote, the old threadbare lie that Negro win, men rape white women, unquote, and had used statements such as, quote, the colored race multiplies like the locusts of Egypt, and the grog shop is at its center, or the liquor shop is at the center of its power, end quote. Wells charged that Willard's position as an internationally known Christian reformer and the leader of an organization with many black women members carried a special duty to speak out against the violence of lynching rather than perpetuate the stereotype that drunken black men threatened the safety of women of childhood and of the home. During the early 1890s, Willard was making a conscious push to grow the membership of the WCTU among white women in the South. While alcohol was a serious problem in the black community, leading to strong support of temperance by, by black women, 
alcohol and drunkenness were also used by whites to stereotype and to discriminate against blacks and other minority groups. White leaders in the women's temperance and suffrage movements made questionable moral compromises by using these racist stereotypes to encourage growth for their causes among Southern white women. Wells confronted Willard directly calling on her and the WCTU to explicitly denounce lynching. At first, Willard tried to defend herself, insisting that she had, quote, not an atom of race prejudice, end quote, citing her family's involvement with the abolition movement, especially her time in Oberlin, and her work supporting Black women in the WCTU. In the face of mounting pressure, Willard eventually took measures to address the issue, including speaking out publicly against lynching. And the WCTU passed anti-lynching anti resolutions in 1894, 1895, and several years following. The conflict attracted international attention and even condemnation of the WCTU and of Willard. And it played out in social media of the day, newspapers, publicly circulated letters and speeches at meetings and conventions. For several years, the two exchanged harsh words and pleaded their cases, as did their allies. But Willard died in 1898 with this conflict mostly unresolved. Willard never apologized for using the language that she did, but her public calls for support for Wells's campaign did somewhat salvage her reputation. Wells continued to work against racism and injustice until her death in 1931, not hesitating to criticize white women reformers when she believed they ignored or perpetuated discrimination. So at the museum and archives, we knew the basic outlines of this conflict for several years prior to starting the project. Scholars had written about it and we discussed it among our, amongst ourselves and wondered how best to talk about it or how not to talk about it, to be honest. We finally decided that we must find a way to fully understand and then tell the story. The first phase of the project was research into what actually had happened. And it became clear that this was gonna be a challenge. Though the story was fairly well known, the original sources were not easily accessible. One of the first things we needed to do was to compile these archival sources so that we could see them all together. So in the spring of 2017, a graduate student team at the public in the public history department at Loyola University of Chicago searched our archives and many other collections to gather the original newspaper articles, speeches, correspondence, and other material into a small collection and online exhibit. In the spring of 2018, one of the students, PhD student Ella Wagner, was hired to complete the construction of the final online exhibit and the launch of Truth Telling, the, the exhibit you can see the front page of which in the screen, Truth Telling, Francis Willard and Ida B. Wells, a documentary website took place in March of 2019. The website consists of an interactive timeline, contextual information, and interpretive essays that help readers understand the conflict and encourages them to explore what happened and draw their own conclusion. It features the primary sources that tell the story of the conflict, and users are able to follow links from the sources to short essays and on some of the relevant context, including temperance, suffrage, re the reconstruction time period when the conflict takes place, short biographies of Willard and Wells, among other things. There are interpretive essays by scholars, museum staff, and community members, including Wells's great-granddaughter, Michelle Duster, and they also reflect on the material a bibliography and a list of other relevant sources are included as well. Our goal was to make the sources we had found in our collection and in other places available in one place so that everyone could examine them, learn from what them what happened and decide for themselves how to judge those involved. 
And that's the, the website is willardandwells.org. What we discovered in this process did not surprise us. The language Willard used and her willing, unwillingness to treat Wells and her anti-lynching cause with the respect and seriousness it deserved were part of the racist climate of her time. But what is so hard to reconcile is that Willard was in many ways so ahead of her time. And why wasn't she on this too? The WCTU was one of the first women's organizations that had black and white women as members. Though it was segregated on the local level, often segregated, its state, national, and world leaders would meet together regardless of their race and national origin. Willard should have led with all the women of the WCT in mind, including the African-American women who were members and leaders. She also should have seen Wells for the rising leader that she was. She was normally very good at seeing new leadership coming and encouraging that leadership within the WCTU. And Willard and Wells really had so much in common, including the support of temp the temperance cause. Willard should have seen that expanding her leadership in ra against racism might have seen played a key role in changing the racial climate of this time period in our country and might have helped address the growing white supremacy around her. Instead, she chose not to see and voiced racist stereotypes that fed this very climate. So a little about the project on the ground in Evanston. Evanston is a large and diverse suburb just north of Chicago. It has its own history around race and struggles to tell that story and confront issues that linger today. Part of our plan was to gauge with our community about the conflict. We did this in a variety of ways, including giving talks like this one, presenting at conferences, writing about the project, sharing it on social media, and highlighting it on our website. Early on in 2018, we welcomed a visit visiting artist to the house, photographer Vanessa Philly, and she created a series of photographs of rooms in the house, including this one that powerfully imagines an actual confrontation between Wells and Willard, a confrontation that really did not take place. We held the public launch of the website in March of 2019 at Northwestern University with more than 200 people attending the discussion and listening to the panelists. In spring, oh, skip one. In spring of 2020, we were pleased to receive honorable mention as Liz mentioned um, for outstanding public history from the National Council on Public History. And later in 2020, we began to look into what we are now informally calling truth telling continued and began assembling resources and building a database to tell the story of black women in the WCTU, the very women that Willard herself ignored. Willard was often portrayed in her lifetime and beyond as a sainted leader who could do no wrong. Letting her be fully human with failings and unmet challenges was a new approach to telling her story and a difficult approach for us to take. Thankfully, we could learn from all the many projects currently going on that take on revered historical leaders and their very real failings. How do we reckon with, there, oh, sorry, it skipped ahead. How do we reckon with historical figures who fought against one form of oppression, in Willard's case, the oppression of women, while shoring up others? We hope our work leads the public to explore this conflict for themselves and draw their own conclusions about Willard and her actions. In this way, maybe we can repair some of the damage she left behind, continue the work she did. She began to advance women's rights and promote a just and equi equitable world for all and be leaders where Willard's leadership failed. Thank you so much for having me. I am happy to take questions or go back and cover parts of the story that you're interested in.
Great. Yeah. Uh, people who want to submit questions, you can, um, it might be if you're submitting it by chat, you can send it to me. Um, or you can also unmute yourself um, to uh, audibly ask a question here. Well, while people are maybe thinking, um, I might ask when Lori, um, how has this, did doing this project change the way your organization operates or thinks about, uh, I guess, Willard and her story? Yes, it really did. Um, it, it's a very interesting exercise to go through to really change from being celebratory and honoring and memorializing to kind of conf confronting this story and letting her be human, just as I said at the end there. And what we've found is that it really, in some ways, it's a little bit liberating, getting away from that sainted figure who can do no wrong and, and really saying, you know, she was just like the rest of us. She was remarkable. There's no question. She was remarkable. And she really did do so much good in her life, but she had blind spots and could not see this, this issue for what it really was. She also could not see that her role in leading was critical. And there were, she's not the only one. There were many leaders in this time period in the 1890s when reconstruction is really coming to an end in our country and a new phase is beginning. There are many people who cannot see that the choices and compromises they're making really is going to lead to 20th century problems. And I sort of personally look at it and think if only there had been some people like Willard and many others who had taken a stronger stand, we might have had a different 20th century um, and then 21st as well. So um, it's, it's, um, it's definitely hard to face these truths, um, but it is just the truth and really saying, okay, this is there. This is the reality. These are these words were printed. There's no question she said them. Um, there's no question this conflict took place. There's no question Wells was right. Um, so let's just talk about that. And and it's okay. And and it really does help us understand where we where we are today. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. And um, uh, Patricia Pitt said uh, she would like to ask a question too. I think she's going to unmute. Great. Hi, Liz. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is in reevaluating your presentation of um, Willard's story, have you received comments from other people, not so much that it's liberating, but that it's, it makes us realize as observers of history that these people weren't saints. So often we're presented with the story throughout our life that you know Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin or whoever it was, we heard only the good. And we, we, we end up within the, the blind spots and not recognizing them as humans and as failing. And we, we, we tend to have this attitude when we look back on history, oh, it was all, you know, these people were always greater or better. And I think that what you're doing here and what a, you know, a lot of people are doing across different museums and history things in telling a more fulsome story, it allows the public to recognize that it wasn't any better then. They were just as fallible back then. They did great things, but they were fallible just like today. You know, we can have great leaders today that are still fallible and doing doing some of it wrong. And mm -hmm. I think I think telling that whole story is going to to better prepare those that we're educating today to recognize maybe their blind spots. And I'm just wondering if you've received any comments similar to that if that's if that's an impression that's 
just mine alone or other people are sharing that impression with yeah we have and um one of the things i it's 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 complicated being honored for doing this work or being appreciated and being you know these this is not this is a hard hard story to to talk about and so i always want to be careful to um to remember that this this the there were lives uh, lost because people like Willard didn't talk, speak up. So, so we, it, it is a little moment of being, you know, mindful and remembering that. But we have received comments from people about um, the work. One of, we just recently received um, a, a short email from a student in Mexico City, actually a public history student who found the website and did a paper about it and, and mentioned how, how impactful just using the website. And I should note that um, we tried very careful, we tried to let the records speak for themselves and to not do a lot of interpreting or explaining or um, uh, saying, here's what happened or here's why it happened. Or, you know, there, there are reasons why, there are clear reasons to me why Willard cannot see um, what's going on here clearly. Um, there are personal reasons, things going on in her life and there are organizational reasons in the WCTU. She's preoccupied, and she's not. She's not at the top of her game in the in these years. She's also having health problems. We don't talk a lot about that on the website because we want the records to speak for themselves and for people to make up their own minds. So the website is very, try, we try to give some context about the time period and about the people involved and the different people who were mentioned in the, in the different archival pieces, but we want the words to stand on their own a little bit as much as we can. So, um, so yes, so the student, for example, had explored the website sounds like from top to bottom and had used it and it's 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 there for people to use um it's not you know we we very much hope that you know the way she used it was exactly what we hope that it gives people the chance to explore it on their own and maybe do some kind of historical critical thinking history wise um which we believe is really um, important in our world today too. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for asking that. I do have another question, Lori, but I'm gonna mm -hmm. give like maybe five seconds of silence just to see if anyone else wanted to chime in here with a question too. Okay, so I'm going to squeeze in another one. And um, you know, you worked for the for the Francis Willard House, and you were able to tell this story. I'm curious: is there a similar organization for Ida B. Wells? Like, where where is a lot of her her uh, history preserved or documents preserved? If if it is, um, I her I don't know exactly where all her her archival collection is. I have the sense that it's scattered though her family and Michelle Duster her great granddaughter have done amazing amazing work to preserve the story and to make sure her story is told um, Wells was one of the people who was going to slip off everyone's radar unfortunately um, without her family working to bring her story to light in recent years we pro we might have lost her story entirely she's one of the um 
Um, she, she was recently an obituary and the New York Times was written for her because no obituary was written for her when she actually died. Um, and uh, the, there's a recovery pro process that the New York Times is going through where they're rewriting obituaries for missing figures and hers was one of them. Um, but anyway, um, but Wells doesn't have a historic house museum where everything was carefully preserved and saved. And I must say, it's one of the things I really I so wish that I could be in conversation with a sister museum um, about this conflict today. Um, her home is preserved and is a landmark in Chicago, but it, it, it one of her homes, but it is not a museum. Um, and there are many, many memorial projects. Um, and now thankfully her memory is being honored widely and in many ways, people are gonna know much more about Wells than they're gonna know about Willard. Um, the tables have completely turned. Um, and so I'm the, the suffrage anniversary and um, the uh, really the need to tell black history in America has surfaced leaders like Wells. Um, there are other women whose stories and, and they were connected to the WCTU um, uh, deserve to be told too. And that's why we're working on that project um, because black women's leadership has been lost and we need to make sure that it's told it was critical throughout our country's history. And it very, and Wells is just the tip of the iceberg of the stories we should all know. Um, so um, I, I, uh, I, I wish for that house museum. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get my wish, but um, we we are in conversation with Michelle Duster, as I mentioned, and um, very much um, part of the conversation of recovering those stories. Thank you. And I actually got a, a direct chat from uh, Betty Lou Higgins, one of the attendees here, saying there is uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett Museum in Holly Springs, Mrs. Yes, that's true. You're right. You're right. That's true. Her childhood home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I should have remembered that. Yeah. I'm thinking the south side of Chicago, wishing for <laughs> one right across town. But yes, you're right. Um, I have one from someone that's just to me about whether or not she was a journalist before moving to Chicago. And yes, she was. She was a journalist in Memphis. And um, she really pioneers investigative journalism in her uh, work to, to uncover the story of, and the problem of lynching throughout the United States, not just in the South. Um, and she comes to Chicago um, because she cannot live safely in Memphis any longer after she starts telling the stories um, and publishing about the problem. So she comes, she makes Chicago her home. She marries in Chicago and I believe has four or five children in Chicago. Um, and she was actively employed uh, throughout her life, both as a journalist, as a writer, an author, as a civil rights leader. She's, Wells' story is just unbelievable and quite remarkable and amazing. And I admire her so much. Um, but once again, I mean, do we really need pedestals for leaders to be admired and um, to be remarkable? No, we don't. And um, Wells was not a perfect leader either. Um, so um, I think it's really important for us to recognize that perfection is not a human possibility. And so many of these people, however remarkable they were, have, have issues and failings they confront like all of us. Uh, we did get a, a comment here I'm going to read. Thank you for a great program. This is from Julie Min. Thank you for a great program and for sharing this fascinating story of both of Wells and Willard and of the process of the project. Will the new phase of research of other Black leaders be also put online eventually or what are your plans for that? 
Yes, um, we're right now we have another student group and thankfully we have this wonderful connection with the public history department at Loyola. Um, and we have a student group work two, three student groups working on um, uh, research and um, presentation of three or four student groups, four states. And um, the WCTU was very much a state um, local and state organization. And so um, we're focusing on, let me see, I'm not leading this project. So let me see if I can remember. Uh, District of Columbia, North Carolina, Illinois, and I'm forgetting the fourth state and I know it'll come to me. Um, but we're doing, so we're doing state by state research right now. Um, on the black women in the WCTU that we will, we are going to be publishing that. We have a database, of hundreds of women and their names. We're hoping that we can um, start to, you know, um, put that database out so that people can help us do this research too. Um, it's, it's remarkable as we kind of uncover the story. We have other stories to tell. So this is, we'll, they, we won't stop there. Um, um, and once you start traveling down this road of truth telling, it, it kind of becomes um, a new set of muscles and, and skills and thinking that um, opens up new avenues um, for stories and, and for really making sure that the whole story gets out there. The WCTU was such a large organization and it was, at a time period so critical in women's lives that really we feel like if you don't, if you're not looking at the WCTU in 1890, you probably don't know what's going on with women in America. Um, it's really so influential. Um, and so we really feel like there's, there's multiple ways and it's almost entirely forgotten, um, probably because of what we all, think and feel about prohibition, which becomes their big 20th century focus, early 20th century focus. So, um, so recovering that story and the story of all the women who were involved in the WCTU and really letting that story have its own life is really one of our main goals. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone who attended tonight. And thank you certainly to Lori Osborne. And I know this was a team effort to everyone on your team who gathered everything for your website. And oh, your no question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Team effort for, for several years now. So yes, thank you to all of them. And thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be able to share the story and share the work. And, and I love the learning the, over, the Overland story. And like I hinted at um, at the beginning, I really, I, I really think it does sort of set Willard on a path, um, that short amount of time, but a very important time in a young girl's life um, to be in a place where this is this, these things are encouraged and, and, and especially women's education is encouraged because you really don't get the WCTO and all of this other work if you don't have educated women doing it. So um, very important part of the story for her. All right, thank you so much. Lee Foreman also expressed her thanks. So um, we might get a few more chats that way. Thank you all so much for coming tonight and please keep an eye on our newsletter for other Similar programs coming in the coming months too. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.